So we have a strong panel and very happy to have with us diverse actors in the space of collective action representing not only different geographies, but also different sectors and uh, different types of stakeholders. So just to introduce you briefly to who we have here on the panel today. So all the way on your left, uh, we have uh, Giovanni Gallo, who is the chief of the Implementation Support Section, Corruption and Economic Crime Branch, Division for Treaty Affairs at the United um, Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So welcome, Giovanni. We also have Andrew Blasey, who's the director at Crowell and Mooring International, working on uh, public-private sector uh, partnerships. And so we're very excited to hear more about uh, what you're engaged in, Andrew. We also have Lena Lauritsen, who's a senior compliance officer at Grunfoss, a global water tech company and pump manufacturer. So also very excited to see how you engage in collective action. And last but not least, we have our discussant for today's panel, Liz David Barrett, who's the head of global program on uh, measuring corruption at the International Anti-Corruption Academy. And until recently uh, with the University of Sussex, and she's currently on leave at IACA. So very happy to have all of you with us today. And if we could just kick it off with uh, Giovanni and how uh, do you at UNODC engage in collective action? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And through you, allow me to thank the Basel Institute on Governance for organizing this fourth conference on, on collective action and giving us an opportunity to come together in person. It's a pleasure and joy to have this opportunity to have in person exchanges after such a long time and to address such an important uh, and relevant topic. I will be um, spending uh, the first two minutes on explaining why the United Nations, uh, an office, particularly the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, engages in collective action. And then I will you know, take a couple of minutes to provide a couple of uh, examples that may be relevant to the, to the whole audience. Um, Obviously, for the UN, uh, our constituents, our clients, are governments. Uh, traditionally, historically, we have not engaged uh, with the private sector or with other non-governmental actors. This has changed approximately 20 years ago and even more forcefully around 2010. What is our, our point of departure? The fact that uh, the world decided that a global international legal instruments against corruption was necessary, and this is the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. that came into force less than 20 years ago. Now, once again, this is a tool developed by governments, negotiated by governments, binding on them. So why does it matter to the private sector? Well, if you look at this, at this treaty, and this I appreciate is probably the least exciting part of the, of the of the conference talking about international legislation, but it is important to, to set, set the stage. If you look at these treaties, there are approximately 40 provisions that are relevant to the private sector. Either it's called by name, or there are clear references to it. Measures on the prevention of corruption, decriminalization of bribery and embezzlement in the private sector, the establishment of liability for legal persons, the regulation of behaviors between public and private officials, also in terms of, 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 of jobs, the regulation of banking and non-banking financial institutions, the whole issue of beneficial ownership. So governments have taken up a commitment to come down with regulations that have a clear relevance to the private sector. And later on, the convention that today has been ratified by 187 parties, member states in the UN being 193, so we're very close to universal ratification, these governments come together on a regular basis every two years and they establish or they charter even further the global anti-corruption policy agenda and they continue to call upon themselves to regulate even more the private sector. It was mentioned by the colleagues at the earlier panel, uh, Navid, there was for the first time in 2021 the General Assembly decided to come together and devote one of its special sessions, never happened before in 77 years of history of the United Nations, a special session on corruption. And that's where you read again encouragements to engage in forms of public-private partnerships and collective action. So here comes the point. What do we want? Do we want governments to impose top-down regulations? Or do we want to engage in a preventive mode 
and informs the MELID to self-regulation, co-regulation. Here is the, the trigger to our engagement in collective action. It was mentioned by Jorge earlier this morning, the, the head of the Supreme Audit Institution of, of Chile. Collective action takes different shapes for us. The development of a national anti-corruption strategy where we support the government, consult with civil society, with business associations and all other stakeholders. And then 2010 comes and thanks to the engagement, the support of Siemens and its uh, uh, integrity initiative and the friends and the partners are here in the room and it's a pleasure to see you once again. Well, that's when we managed to take this one step forward. From that point on, we've been running nine projects around the world, five of which are still active, covering 16 countries plus global components. And let me offer some, some concrete examples of how these has turned into advancements of collective action, action issues and results. Again, prevention and education, beautiful words, but how does it translate in reality? Well, we have put together over the years uh, 16 university modules on corruption. Corruption and, the, corruption and the private sector, corruption in human rights, corruption in conflict, corruption in organized crime, available to all the universities in the world. Under one of the projects, uh, under the Siemens Integrity Initiative, we are operating in three specific countries, Mexico, Pakistan and Kenya, uh, reaching out to 16,500 students, having trained 300 lectures, and having uh, used, in this, in this specific context, guest lectures from the private sector, coming into universities and teaching students, teaching the possible leaders of tomorrow, what their dilemmas are, what their issues are, and taking this one step forward. As a result of this education drive, the students that have received this, this, this knowledge and education will be given internship opportunities in the compliance departments of the companies that have adhere to this program. So this is a clear example of how with little engagement from the public side of the world, the private sector, the academic world, and there are several representatives today of that, of that important sector, are building the generations of, of tomorrow. But collective action has also enabled us to reach to places where otherwise we would not have been able to work. Case in point, Myanmar, we started to work there in 2019. Political events of 2020 are well known. And most of the UN family withdrew from the country, if not for humanitarian reasons. We continue to be active there, engaging only with the business community. Having created their mechanisms, tools for local companies to be educated about notions of ethics and integrity, notions which are not as well established in some parts of the world as they may be in others, and start to talk in a country like Myanmar about whistleblowing, reporting, and protection mechanisms. So this is how we have come from being responsible for a multilateral treaty, which is certainly a commitment for governments by governments, to broadening the space, engaging indeed in, uh, in other, engaging other sectors, and, and bringing about, in a preventive mode, uh, all the benefits that collective action can generate. Allow me to conclude by announcing that today, under this drive that I've just described, we are launching uh, a business integrity portal. Um, it's uh, a repository of all the tools, all the resources, all the work that we have been doing for the past 12 years on collective action. So, I invite you to visit uh, the exhibition booth, which is upstairs during the break. And I stop here, Vanessa, and ready to take any questions that the floor may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And I know some of your colleagues from UNODC, including me and Mara, are here in the room today. So uh, later on during the networking lunch, please go <laughs> ahead and, and reach out to them. Um, we'll, we'll now move on to, to Andrew, and um, Andrew comes with a unique perspective, I mean, with, with a unique role in the space of collective action, and leading the work in consensus frameworks, which is a, an innovative uh, way of engaging in collective action. So uh, please tell us more about this. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Vanessa. Can everybody hear me? 
Okay, great. Well, again, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Basel Institute, for organizing this amazing conference uh, in this amazing city. Um, it's a priv privilege for me to be with all of you today and to share more about a very innovative collective action approach that is starting to emerge in a significant way uh, to drive ethics across and anti-corruption across health systems around the world, which is particularly important uh, given what we're seeing today. I also, before I delve in, I want to figuratively share the stage today with a couple of extraordinary individuals who are present with us in the room and in the world of consensus frameworks. Sophie Mellis of the IFPMA, Kane Kote of the HCCC, Karen Ayrou of the Access to Medicines Foundation, and Terry Cote of, uh, of the Cantu uh, of the uh, Fee Pharma and Amif. These are incredible women uh, and leaders within the space, and I hope after uh, today's session, you'll have a chance to meet with all of them uh, here at the conference. Um, also, I have uh, shared with the Basel Institute a fairly informative um, series of information on consensus frameworks, so I'm just gonna share a little bit with all of you today at a high level, what's going on and the impact that these are having. But know that if you want more information in addition to talking during the breaks, there'll be more information posted online about these, um, about consensus frameworks. I'd like to begin today by being a little provocative. I always think it's a great way to start a discussion like this. By show of hands, and I, uh, I have a chat from our good friend, uh, the Director General of the Anti-Corruption uh, Commission within Mauritius alluded to this during the first panel. How many folks within the room today, um, and don't be shy, have seen a negative headline related to corruption or unethical conduct during the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of health systems? <laughs> Pretty much everyone, right? Now, my provocative statement is this, and do not get me wrong at all, I think shining light and sunshine within the darkest corners of every part of our society is critical. Without that, there's no accountability leading to responsibility. But the provocative statement is this, in the context of healthcare, that type of sunshine, in the absence of true action, in the absence of true change, actually causes more damage. And one might say, well, why? How does that happen? Mistrust in the context of the health system costs lives. And if we have a system that can shine light in the darkest corners, but it doesn't lead to change, We've known for some time that that can cause even more challenges. What we didn't know and did not have an experiment at such grand scale as the COVID-19 pandemic to prove this is was recently exposed within the context of an article in Lancet at the end of 2021. I'll make sure to include this for folks who have interest. Um, and for those who don't know, The Lancet's probably the premier medical journal around the world that publishes some of the best research. It showed the, the purpose of this study was to assess the impact or what were, the, what were the, the contextual factors associated with COVID-19 preparedness, infection rates, and death. What were the greatest correlations that led to higher infections during the course of the pandemic? The Lancet concluded something fascinating that I think should be important for all of us in the room today, regardless of what aspect of what sector we work in, we're all a part of the, the collective action community in ethics and, and anti-corruption. Quote, pandemic preparedness indices were not meaningfully associated with standardized infection rates across 180 countries around the world, meaning there was no meaningful correlation associated between how prepared a country was to deal with a pandemic relative to the percent of infections of the, of the, of the pandemic of, of COVID-19 that took place. The most meaningful item that was found was that government corruption and trust within that system, trust of the patients within that system that they operate in, was the most meaningful correlation to COVID-19 infection rates. Where we looked at the top performing countries around the world, where there's less government corruption, less incidence within the systems, and higher degrees of trust by the citizenry in their health system, for governments alone, 13% less infections among the population. And interpersonal trust rates in the health system, those countries had 40% less COVID-19 infection rates. So this is incredible, and what it tells us, and what it shows us, and this is the key message, if you walked away with nothing else from my presentation today, it's this. When it comes to healthcare, 
Corruption prevention, preventing it from occurring in the first place, is the most important thing we can do. And while enforcement matters, patient trust requires a great deal more. So for those who are not familiar with health systems, what's really important to note is that they are incredibly diverse, right? No one health system around the world at a national or subnational level is the same as another. And they're incredibly complex. The series of actors that must engage with each other to ultimately come together to serve the patient's need at the moment they need it is absolutely enormous. And as a result, so are the risks that are associated from a corruption and an unethical conduct perspective. Importantly, unethical conduct in the context of health systems, the dilemmas that are faced are also very complex. We can think about traditional notions of corruption, risk of bribery, fraud, et cetera, but also more broadly applying that out to business practices writ large. How do companies, public or private, operate within health systems from a business pra daily business practice perspective has huge, huge impacts. Same with technology ethics, or now it's the buzzword techno-ethics. How is artificial intelligence being de deployed within health systems in an ethical manner? And then, of course, you enter into the realm of biology ethics or bioethics, and the clinical decisions that are made can have enormous consequences. So this is a very, very complicated space. And so that brings us to what I'm introducing to all of you today, which is the introduction of consensus frameworks. I want in your mind to imagine a table, a table where diverse actors within a health system can come together on a voluntary, fit-for-purpose basis to address these challenges in a way that aims to prevent the problem, the corruption, the unethical behavior from occurring at all, or ideally to start creating a platform where folks can more openly and collectively work on solutions rather than just responding to challenges. Um, now, what I think is important before I share practical examples from what's happening around the world in this context, it's important, m many folks ask me and others that are involved within what is essentially now a movement across health systems around the world towards consensus frameworks. What are some of the things that parties that are coming around this table doing? And I think it's important to just note that first, and then we can talk about some examples in different countries. Setting common ethical principles and aligning values is, very, is, is crucial. Many of you would be surprised to know that one of the reasons there's lots of challenges within health systems at all is because for a system that's so complex and interconnected, many of these parties, in not just emerging and uh, um, low and middle income countries, but in developed economies, many of these actors don't communicate with each other. They don't understand what constitutes certain norms of ethics and integrity, and they don't have mechanisms in place to align their values at all. And so that's, a, of course, a fundamental component. More sophisticated, comparing and actually contrasting and aligning codes of conduct. When you have different operators within the same system that have different standards of conduct, that's a problem. It can lead to misinterpretations, and ultimately it can lead to substandard outcomes. And of course, as we heard from Margaret this morning, you can imagine in a system of, of willful blindness, when you have parties that don't even understand what the North Star is, that makes it even worse. So a system in place to actually align those codes of conduct. Some parties come together to actually then develop joint training curriculum for their own respective constituencies. If we align our values, how are we communicating that, those out to our networks? Monitoring changes to the environment, serving as early warning detection platforms, and then ultimately, and very importantly, including the patient voice within this process altogether. Many actors within health systems think they know best, but ultimately, what's the role of patients, the end consumer of anything within a health sector? What's their voice in this process? Consensus frameworks as a concept, were, uh, the idea came about in 2014, so many years before the pandemic, and it started at the international level. <clears throat> many leading international health stakeholders, ranging from the World Medical Association, representing all national physicians associations around the world, the peak bodies, all together with the International Patients Alliance, International Nurses Federation, the International Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, and the International Hospital Federation, collectively representing thousands of entities around the world, took the first step to say, we think there's something here. It wasn't until two years later, in 2016, Thanks in particular to an initiative that I know many of you are aware of within the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, 
where this started to translate itself into where these stakeholders actually live and work and operate on a day-to-day -day basis, which is at the national level, right? This is where health systems operate, and this is where these challenges can go wrong in the context of what happens in those systems. Many of you have heard about, especially from a private sector perspective, but really any organization, tone for the top in ethics and integrity is crucial. In the context of a, of a concept like this, so is tone at the top from governments. And I was so heartwarmed to hear from our first panel just a few moments ago of the role that governments are now seeing themselves as not just reacting to the environment, but proactively engaging with stakeholders to prevent corruption. That's awesome. And we need a lot more of that. And I think that is exactly what we saw happen in the APEC context. Ministers and heads of state came together across these 21 countries to endorse consensus frameworks. And that was a game changer. So now what we've seen happen in this context, and uh, there's a by the numbers slide, which I, I can, you can all refer to later, but fast forward from 2016 to 2022, there are now 11 countries that have adopted consensus frameworks and they're geographically diverse. North and South America, Oceania, and Asia. We'll talk about some frameworks that are presently under development in a moment. Of these 11 countries, there are now 240 parties that are members of these 11 framework agreements. The top stakeholder, 87 of these entities, are healthcare professional bodies representing millions of doctors, nurses, and uh, pharmacists, and other key operators within these health systems. 76 industry associations representing over 10,000 health companies across these 11 countries. 30 hospital provider groups, which represent over 100,000 hospitals and clinics across these countries. 18 patients' bodies, representing, of course, millions of patients across these countries, 18 government entities, and to connect it to the point about public sector participation within frameworks, it's not just the health ministries, it's the anti-corruption ministries, right? It's the comptroller general, it's the accountability offices within these countries, even the trade and commerce ministries are getting involved within the context of this collective action and along with many other institutions, academic, civil society, et cetera. There are consensus frameworks that are now under development in four countries, including in Africa. So I think from a proof of concept standpoint, we're getting ever closer to the reality of uptake um, across, across the world. From a success factor point of view, and consensus frameworks are still new, so we're only still realizing uh, what the potential right, might be uh, in their success, we're really now starting to see uh, data coming in showing that engagement levels are happening in ways that have never happened before. So we've looked at data and we've asked many of these parties to assess their volume of engagements with other actors within health systems over time. So each year, how frequently are you engaging with other parties in your health ecosystem on anti-corruption ethics and compliance issues? What's fascinating is many of you may not have heard of spider graphs or charts, but what it essentially shows is that over time, as consensus frameworks have expanded, other metrics of success in terms of communicating ethics and other factors, uh, engaging in training and capacity building, have followed along with it. So essentially, this platform, this table, is starting to work. With, uh, it's like lightning in a bottle. That lightning wasn't happening before, and now we've created a bottle with which these parties can do it. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through examples from different countries around the world, but just to say they're incredibly diverse, and it can range from, uh, like we see in Australia, and a new, completely independent organization has been formed to implement this framework, all the way through to voluntary collective groups of stakeholders with minimal to no resources that are actually making policy recommendations to governments. It's quite fascinating. So as we look ahead, there are a couple of things that are going to influence, I think, the trend of consensus frameworks and their elaboration beyond of which we know is a ripe environment coming out of the pandemic for real change here. New countries, so we should expect to see more countries add on to this movement. New stakeholders, the inclusion of new and diverse voices within the process that will be able to contribute to the output of great uh, solutions. New governance models, and I want to thank the Basel Institute for being a tremendous partner in this movement to help identify effective governance models for very complex gatherings of stakeholders, which ultimately lead to new tactics of sustainability, 
things that organizations can now do and modify in their practices to, that lead to a permanence of this type of collective action. And of course, new issues. We're finding that, as many of you might expect, ethics is the foundation to so much more. If you have ethical conduct and you have trust, maybe these stage, stakeholders can work together to do other very important things, like find new cures faster that can serve patient needs better. So with that, I now turn the floor back to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Andrew. Perfect timing with the bells. Um, and, and also, I mean, it's really fascinating to see the increasing interest in consensus frameworks within very complex healthcare ecosystems. So we'll get back to that um, later on. And now I'd like to turn over to uh, Linev, who comes in from the private sector, so very different angle to collective action. So can you please walk us through your collective action journey as a private sector stakeholder? Sure. And uh, thank you very much to um, the Basel Government Governance Institute and um, the Siemens Integrative uh, Initiative for this uh, opportunity to be here and uh, share Grundfos uh, perspectives on collective action. Many of you don't know Grundfos, but yet you use water every day. And uh, Grundfos is a company that uh, pioneers um, solutions to the water um, and, and climate uh, challenges that we are facing in the world uh, for improving quality of life uh, for people. And it's great to see so many people here in the room fighting for a better and fairer world. Um, in Grundfos, um, it's a private company, and um, the founder, um, Paul Du Jensen, uh, many years ago, uh, had a friend who needed water in the fields, uh, so he helped him out. And um, he founded the company in the aftermath of um, the Second World War in 1945. And um, there were a lot of challenges at that time. At the same time, he was also a brother, having a sister who needed uh, special attention and special care. So he understood that uh, to get her to thrive, he needed um, uh, working conditions that also allowed, uh, or allowed uh, such uh, employments. Now, um, the, today, Grundfos is um, a company with uh, 20,000 employees. We are based uh, in 100 uh, countries around the world with uh, sales companies, manufacturing of uh, pumps and pump solutions. And um, so, very true. Tone from the top is there, and that is so important. We, we do understand that uh, in Grundfos, and that is also what we work with. My journey with um, Grundfos has been uh, 25 years uh, plus. And uh, I have an engineering background. So uh, eight, ten years ago, um, I got uh, into the uh, legal department actually to bridge the challenges between the business and all the legal stuff. So um, I was part of uh, building up uh, the, the compliance programs. Uh, and I was also invited in with uh, a team uh, regarding anti-corruption because they wanted more structure on the compliance program. And what do you do when you are asked to make uh, a risk assessment? You actually reach out to the wealth of guidelines and support um, available. So uh, we uh, looked into the UN Global uh, Risk Assessment Guides, um, OECD guidelines on anti-corruption, uh, and so forth. UK Bribery Act that also have some guidelines. And then we took out what we thought suited us the best. And uh, we uh, made this uh, risk assessment. And then we also invited a law firm to kind of um, challenge ourselves and to prove that we did it the right way. And also to, to kind of get a confirmation on that. And this is, um, of course, easy when you have, a, uh, have the tone of voice uh, from the management. But I can tell you it gets even more easy 
when uh, it is requested by the customers. So um, I think that is the, the, way, the way we at least uh, see things are going, that uh, we need to operate in a transparent way and uh, because our customers request it and also because we think it is the right thing to do. Um, just a small example, um, I used to go by taxi between uh, Brasov and uh, Bucharest uh, as my husband was working in Romania and there I met this uh, taxi driver who um, would always complain about the road conditions in Romania, claiming that they actually have the highest budgets in on infrastructure in Romania. And he was like, where do all the money go? Because he couldn't see it on the roads. There was this one road to the, to the Black Sea where all the, the, the resorts are, but uh, between the bigger cities, no roads. And this actually gave me some inspiration for, for our journey because um, we, we kind of also need to convince our colleagues that it is important to uh, engage uh, in, in different ways to, um, to improve our sales, obviously. And, and collective action is not the obvious business case uh, to sell into to management or to um, to um, to our uh, colleagues. Uh, so, but but having a good reason, and and this is uh, where where you can see uh, the link to the sto the short story with um, this taxi driver. Because think about it, if. Um, if all the money put into water infrastructure actually goes to water infrastructure, that would make yeah, the world a better place, that would provide more access to water, and it would also do uh, actually expand uh, the markets for Grundfos. So totally win-win situation. Um, yeah, so... Um, back to um, the, the, the compliance uh, programs in, in Grundfos, because it, it didn't end with this uh, risk assessment. We, uh, it's a continuous uh, process uh, that, that we have implemented, and now we, we do uh, the risk assessments every other year by ourselves, and uh, we thought it would be time also to um, engage um, more, not just on our own, but, but in a broader perspective to uh, Im improve our programs and to learn more. So last year we joined the uh, BAFP in initiative, the fight against facilitation pay uh, payments, which we thought was um, a great opportunity uh, to share uh, some of the challenges that, that we uh, feel are there, and uh, also um, to, um, yeah, to share uh, knowledge uh, about what, what can we do internally in the company to improve our compliance programs. So, also last year, we um, reached out to um, the Basel Institute uh, because uh, we've read something about the uh, Collective Action Initiative uh, Compliance Without Borders uh, incorporation, which, which you have incorporation with uh, the OECD. And um, in the beginning it was mainly because we, we thought that, that we could learn something, but then Gemma said, but, but maybe you could also uh, share your thoughts on how to build up compliance programs. So we were um, paired with uh, a state-owned enterprise to, to share our thoughts on uh, compliance programs. And um, that was wonderful because how often do you get an opportunity to talk with peers 
uh, about your work. And uh, that was what we did in this uh, project. So uh, we um, teamed up and uh, first shared our views on how we work and the Grundfos compliance program. Then I was introduced to the state-owned enterprise uh, and how they have been working with it and their thoughts on it. And we kind of uh, determined uh, what subjects uh, to, to discuss and, and to share thoughts on. And um, yeah, I think it, it contributed both uh, to me, but uh, also to, uh, to my colleague uh, in, in the state-owned enterprise. Yeah. So I think that's um, all there is to say, just um, as a final note. If you want to learn more about the challenges that we see in Grundfos, you could go to waterbear.com and watch the movie Into Dust, uh, because that will certainly explain that uh, we see challenges or we hear about challenges, not necessarily facing them ourselves, because we are a sub, sub, sub supplier, but uh, there are people out there struggling for water and it sometimes get the worst out of people. So go to waterbear.com and uh, see the movie. Yeah, that's about it. Well, thank you very much, Elena, for sharing your collective action journey and, uh, and also the different initiatives in which you're currently involved. I'm sure that uh, colleagues at the Fight Against Facilitation Payments Initiative are very happy that you're sharing uh, your insights in over 100 countries. And there, uh, there will be, by the way, upstairs later on um, for the networking lunch and also the exhibitions um, on the second floor. So uh, we'll, we'll now move on to Liz and uh, basically using your wealth of experience in the space of um, anti-corruption, but most importantly, collective action. and. Uh, and basically, what's your take on, on the presentations and also in terms of the research that you do? Yeah, thanks very much, Vanessa, and to all the panelists. It's great to hear about the diversity of things that are happening. Uh, so a few years ago, I wrote a paper which actually came out of a previous Basel Institute Collective Action Conference. And the paper was uh, looking at the conditions for success of collective action. And it argued, drawing from theory on collective action, that there were three conditions for success. Uh, the first one was that there should be some real cost of membership. So to get involved in collective action, you needed to make some kind of costly investment, which might be a commitment. Um, it secondly said that there needed to be selective benefits. So for those who were involved, they get something that you don't get if you're not involved. And thirdly, there needed to be monitoring and evaluation. So if you were making that commitment, we needed to check that people were actually sticking to the commitment. And if they weren't, there needed to be some consequences of that. And at the time of writing the paper, that monitoring part was definitely the weakest. So we saw lots of initiatives emerging where there were commitments being made, there were benefits accruing, often reputational benefits. Uh, to the organizations and individuals that were getting involved. But the monitoring part was still quite underdeveloped and quite weak. And so what I'm interested in, you know, listening to Greta's and Gemma's and Sabina's opening remarks today in the morning, you know, we've got a lot of years of experience now. We've been through lots of different initiatives, lots of different cycles. And so what I was interested and what I'd like to ask the panel about is around how do you think this monitoring aspect has emerged and, and what have we learned? And a couple of things that, that struck me that came out during the presentations. Um, firstly, you know, Giovanni, you talked about how difficult this is in a way because this is largely preventive work. And that's a big problem for measurement. How do you measure that something hasn't happened? Um, so, how do, we, how do you think about that? And Giovanni, you also talked about 
your impact in terms of being able to reach places that we hadn't been able to reach before. I thought that was quite interesting. In some ways, it's taking some of the politics out of anti-corruption by bringing in so many different partners. So any reflections uh, on that from you? Andrew, you talked about uptake and you know, huge amount of uptake and many different countries getting involved. But do we know that that uptake is actually uh, valuable? What's the quality of that? Naveen mentioned this morning, how do we measure effectiveness? You know, are we just getting lots of initiatives, but is it really having an impact? And Lena, you talked about um, much more awareness now of the harms of corruption and how part of your work in developing this has been getting that message out in the organization about why this matters. So I was just interested to pick up on all of those aspects and different ways in which I think you are quantifying impact, but would also be really interested to hear from you how you think about that whole question of, of monitoring and assessing uh, the effectiveness. I don't know if we could have quick responses. Of course, absolutely, yeah. Giovanni. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for these. Uh, these are uh, very, very important questions uh, for the UN, and not only uh, the work that we do counts, relies on 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 contributions, on donations from governments, from non-government actors. So, their question is: What's our return of investment? How are we, how can how do, can we make sure that our investment in your work brings the results that we want to see? Well. Two sides of it, um, and let me come to the to the preventive area second. There is certainly something that we can measure in the field of collective action, which is the change, the institutional or legal frameworks that 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 we bring about. Colombia, as an example, we've been working uh, in collective action for a number of years. Well, um, in 2016, uh, it was clear that the Law on corporate liability in Colombia had to be had to be changed, had to be modified. It was not sufficient to satisfy the requirements of the UN Convention Against Corruption. What did we do there? We brought together a committee of of government representatives, business representatives, civil society organisations, and looked at the legislation as it was, as it should be. And that committee created generated 40 recommendations, presented then to the legislative authorities. 37 of which made it into the final law. So this is a change that we can certainly put on the book. We are aware the laws are a means to an end. Uh, laws are not there just to embrace the books, they're there to be implemented, but they are an indispensable step. So there is where something can be, and there are many other examples uh, like this that can be, can be certainly mentioned. In the field of education, you're right, you're like this. Uh, how do you measure prevention? which means how do you measure something which hasn't happened? And coming from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and having more of an history of a drug control agency where we engage very much in drug prevention, how did you measure how many people did not use drugs as a result of your preventive work? Not easy, um, but not for this reason we are not doing it. In the uh, Business uh, Integrity Education Program that I alluded to a moment ago, there is an inbuilt monitoring mechanism that follows all the steps of the project. Doesn't come at the end. Doesn't come at at the midterm evaluation cycle. It goes throughout all the steps by engaging the students, by engaging the lecturers, by engaging the guest lecturers, by engaging the the professors, and asking them to report on a regular basis. What has changed in your teaching, in your approach to to the topic? What did you do or not do? a year after having been trained on how to teach certain courses. And also the bringing students into internships in companies and their compliance departments. I mean, education, of course, is a generational exercise. I mean, how many years did we all spend in between schools and universities? Of course, you cannot back to your donor and say, I'll tell you in 20 years if the result of the work was effective or not. So we need to engage in, and we're doing so, in regular monitoring as well as the long-term impact that education will generate over generations. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I've answered your questions, Liz. <laughs> so maybe I'll just add a couple of thoughts to that, because Liz, these are just the great, great questions. Um, very briefly on the monitoring piece, because we could, I could spend an hour talking about, in the context of health systems, the role of data 
and its overlap between uh, this space and, and how data is collected and, and assessed within the context of health systems effectiveness. But I think the main message I really do want to uh, convey is that data quality, the type of data we think about collecting is ultimately key. I mean, in, in short, we are just at the beginning of, I think, a process that's connecting higher standards of ethics, integrity, prevention of corruption, and its correlation and causation connection to improved health outcomes. So I think the short answer is we're just at the beginning of that journey. But I want to also say that, that this journey is multifaceted. Sometimes research and how we monitor and how we bring new information to bear that can affect a system like, like healthcare uh, is, is, uh, may not be uh, as self-evident. In the context of APEC and the initiative I mentioned briefly before, just last year, the initiative partnered with Ethisphere and the University of London Royal Holloway to produce a very novel piece of research. And it asked this question, from 2019, predating the pandemic, to the end of 2021, looking at small and medium-sized enterprises only across diverse countries around the world, those enterprises in the business of healthcare, those with higher ethics and compliance maturity, did they fare better economically than those SMEs that had lower degrees of ethics and compliance maturity? We had honestly no idea what these results would demonstrate, right? And if some hypothesis would suggest that actually in a short burst period like that, during a pandemic, you actually would see those SMEs that had low compliance maturity doing quite well, right? They were skirting the system, right? They were less willing to take sort of measured steps, right, in their protocols to achieve economic return. Exactly the opposite result. Companies with higher, across 56 measures of effective ethics and compliance maturity, significantly outperformed those small and medium-sized companies that had higher maturity. So I asked this question, including to our government friends in the room today, this is a personal view, why in the world are we creating carve-outs for SMEs in integrity and procurement? It's in the SME's benefit and interest to start adopting and incorporating best practices. They will perform better. They will become larger companies. They will grow. They will be able to access new markets. They will be able to integrate into the different values that exist across countries, which we're starting to see align in terms of norms. I can't believe, uh, Liz, there was actually a push. So others in the room may know this better than I. There was a push under the UK Anti-Bribery Act a few years ago to create a carve-out for SMEs. I've heard the same thing with the FCPA. Why? Because it will burden small and medium-sized companies in an industry to have adopt integrity provisions. So anyway, I just leave that for thought. In the context of healthcare, we're beginning to assess that a little bit better. You, you mentioned also, Liz, uptake uh, quality and implementation, specifically in the context of consensus frameworks. Um, I, I would point out that, that we're only at the beginning of seeing a number of effective uh, outputs and measurable outcomes as to what these parties are now actually doing together to better impact the environment with which they operate. And we have many different examples we could share. But I want to go back to the main point that I mentioned before, which is these frameworks, what's so interesting in terms of effect of implementation and benefits, these parties have actually never been in the room before together on anything, let alone starting at the foundation of ethics and business integrity, right, and aligning what our values are. To be able to quantify the benefit of that is, is really not, not yet known. But eth I, I leave that message to the audience. Ethics as a foundation to broader collaboration and integrity, we don't, we, it's gonna be very hard to measure that output, but we think it will be very, very positive. Great news, yeah. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I think I will take some of that back with me. Great. Yeah. <laughs> In uh, Grundfos, uh, to answer uh, your question before, what, what we have done is actually, and, and it's maybe more simple because it's a company, and uh, we know who the employees are, so we can simply ask them, what, have you read our code of conduct? And, uh, um, and the next question would be, uh, do you believe that we actually live it? Uh, because in that way, we will get an indication on uh, what, what our own colleagues uh, believe. Are we actually, do we uh, yeah, walk the talk, so to speak? So, um, yeah. 
Well, thank, I, I'd be actually curious to see uh, your, to hear your point of view, Liz, in all of this. Obviously, we've done tremendous research on the topic. So is there any best practice you, you could share today with the audience, or at least food for thoughts when it comes to measuring prevention and, and you know, a negative, basically? So um, in our new project, actually, at IACA, we're thinking about how to, how to tackle these issues of, uh, of measuring both corruption and anti-corruption. So getting into these... Uh, prevention issues. I mean, the, I would say you know, we're at a very early stage of this, but one thing that's really core to us in that work is listening to how uh, indicators around corruption and anti-corruption are being used. Uh, so we're actually really interested to hear from all of the people who are using them. And, and one of our principles, too, is that we... Um, we think there probably isn't one size fits all. So I think as anti-corruption practitioners, we often talk about there's no one size fits all um, for doing anti-corruption. And yet we're not really feeding that through when we think about measurement and indicators, because of course with that, there's this will to, to standardize all the time and to come up with something that is best practice. Um, but I think actually probably part of the answer is around being able to decentralize and disaggregate and have much more nuanced measures, which are appropriate for particular programs uh, that you are you know, implementing. You know, having said that, you know, there might be some, some common themes around you know, what works and what doesn't, and also around being able to think about what are the limitations of any measures, and nothing's going to be perfect. Well, thank you, and I'm sure that the audience would like to, to also engage uh, at this point, and maybe also get back to you separately on if you have any thoughts in terms of uh, users of, of those type of indicators. Um, just seeing a couple of questions on the screen. Uh, the first question is a couple of questions for Andrew. Um, so any thoughts on how do we turn transparency into genuine accountability, Andrew? If I had a perfect answer to that question, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could do even more great things. Um, you know, Tran transparency is interesting, right? Everybody in this room is a strong supporter of transparency, right? I, I think this is without, maybe this is an indirect way of, of answering the question. Transparency, regardless of what specific definition or application you're applying this notion of shining greater attention and greater light onto what's happening, the reality is technology in particular, but also a lot of other factors, right? Greater awareness of what's happening, greater mechanisms of exchanging information. If the transparency is real, if it's not, you know, we have issues of misinformation, you know, we, that's a whole separate conversation we could have. But if the transparency is real, I think we can all suggest that transparency is like a train that's moving and it's not gonna stop. So for every organization, you have a choice. Private sector, government, civil society, you have a choice. If transparency is a moving train, are you going to stand still? Or are you going to you going to progress with it? So, from an accountability perspective, we could talk about who holds people to account, but also think about self-accountability. If transparency is something that can't be stifled and make ebb and flow in its intensity, organizations, the most successful organizations in the future, are going to be ones who hold themselves to higher degrees of accountability. Thank you. Thank you. And. I think um, on, on, the same, on the same topic, basically, trust, accountability, but um, also making sure that uh, you have stakeholder engagement. So maybe to, to you, Giovanni, one of the questions uh, was, how did you ensure uptake among your stakeholders, and specifically universities? Well, that is, um, I don't want to say relatively easy, but it's part of our concept when we started to engage in education is a subset of, of prevention. Obviously, we are you know, UN officials. So we don't really have the background of educators, of lecturers, of universities. So the modules that we've put together were developed together with universities from the beginning, at least the, the, the broad concepts. Then, um, and those modules are available on our website. Everyone can look at them. Everyone can download them. Everyone can use them. Uh, they're just there. Every university w wants to make use of them. Where is it that we see further engagement with, with universities? The so-called localization. Let me explain what that, what that means in, in very simple terms. 
there are some examples uh, whereby, I mean, what is one of the most, one of the easiest way to launder, hide the legal origin of your profits? You just spend a couple of nights in a casino. You just, you know, gamble, play, and you come out. I mean, you can, that's undeclared wealth. That example fits well in some parts of the world. Doesn't fit well in other parts of the world where gambling is not legal, where casinos don't exist. And this is just one of the many examples where as we apply, as universities from the east, the west, the north, and the south of the world ask us to help them uh, use these modules, that's when we sit down together and we localize them and we make them fit to the local context, the local culture, to that particular sensitivity. But this is work done from the very beginning with universities, and that club is growing. Thank you, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> Uh, another question uh, for Lina this time, um, looking at the business case for collective action and, and also the resources uh, allocated for collective action. So it's a topic that, that is quite recurring. Is, is, so how do you manage that within your organization? Well, um, what now again, as, as also mentioned, um, it, we are probably quite fortunate that we do have a management that uh, realize that in today's business environment, it is simply uh, extremely important to be uh, transparent and um, do business um, in, an, in a fair way. So um, that one is, is not super difficult. Um, then, of course, um, we do see colleagues, um, they, they need to understand why it is important that they do the right thing. So we spend a lot of uh, efforts on uh, explaining that um, uh, to, to the business and, and also to do it in a very simple way where it makes sense because basically what we need our colleagues uh, to do is to do the right things and they need to know and understand how to do it. So that is actually very much uh, what, what uh, my work is about. How do we communicate this and, and how do we um, convince people that, that they have to, to go this extra mile because that is something sometimes what it is. Um, yeah. Um, regarding uh, collective action, that is not uh, necessarily something where we would engage all uh, employees in the company. Uh, that would be just a few, and uh, depending on, on the nature of it. Uh, so far, for instance, uh, compliance with our borders has only been me and uh, my manager, and it's not something that we really uh, have uh, shared so much uh, internally. Whereas uh, I could see uh, like the FAFPI initiative as an initiative where we would need to consider how to incorporate that in, uh, in, our, in our business. Uh, should it be something where, where, you, you know, where we get, uh, where, we, where we see things uh, that are collected uh, through our whistleblower system or uh, would it be something we would uh, share more broadly and and also communicate? We we haven't decided that yet. So it really depends uh, on on the activities. Yeah. Thank you. And it'd be interesting to see your journey and how how this advances. There was a question on the screen that just disappeared, but I'd like to get back to Liz. Uh, it was a point about indicators and um, looking at your work in terms of conditions for success uh, for collective action initiatives. It was, uh, yeah, it's back on, thank you. Um, so indicators for monitoring have to be realistic, agreed on by parties and contained in memorandum of agreement that sets out roles and responsibilities. Do you think that this is a statement that kind of reflects what you've seen in your research uh, for conditions for success or, or do you have other views? Yeah, so I think when it, does, when it comes to evaluating particular programs and interventions, then it is important to, to set out how you're going to measure things at the beginning and to design that in and think about it early on. Um, there is also perhaps a need, though, to evolve. So it might be that as things go on and progress, you need to come up with new indicators and, and think about also potentially redesigning. So I think one thing that's quite interesting with collective action is the sort of life cycle of a collective action initiative. Do you 
you know, at the beginning, it might be quite easy to motivate countries um, with the reputational benefits. As it starts to get broader and wider, um, then there's, you know, there are fewer organizations outside, and so is there such a big benefit of being inside? So then maybe you need to ratchet things up and, and increase the standards in order to keep up the momentum. EITI is quite an interesting example of this, I think, where it you know, keeps increasing the standards over time, and I think that's been quite critical to success in terms of you know, managing that so you've still got reputational benefits um, of, of being a member of the organization um, and you know, showing that you're complying with the standards, but they're also moving things along. The best indicators are ones that actually motivate change and, and progress, but for that, I think you do need to keep evolving them. Yeah, thank you, and uh, it's, a, it's a good introduction for this afternoon's panel because we'll be having EITI in the next session, so, so it's, a, it's a perfect segue into that, and also in the interest of time, we'll be wrapping up this panel, and we're basically what's standing between uh, your your lunch break, <laughs> so uh, a couple of uh, maybe a couple of uh, remarks still, just to let you know that we're also engaging in different ways of collective action, and just to mention that we're also the Basel Institute has launched a mentoring program. So of course here on the panel we have great ways of diverse ways of, of basically engaging in collective action and leading in that field, but we also have other organizations present today, so I'll just uh, name a few, of, I mean, all of them are present. I think they all made it from various parts of the world. So we have the Canadian Center of Excellence for Anti-Corruption, who is with us today. Also, I, I don't know where they are, if you could briefly, yeah, wave over there. They'll be upstairs, they'll have a, a presentation later on in the uh, exhibition. We also have the Center for Public Integrity from Mozambique, uh, who's here with us, uh, and the Southern African Anti-Corruption Network, also one of our mentees, the Réseau Ivoirien Jeune Leader pour l'Integrité, who also made it all the way here, uh, and also, um, well, Connie was mentioned earlier by Andrew, but uh, Health Charities of Canada, leading the consensus framework in Canada. And the uh, final uh, mentee is the Brazilian Institute of Business Law and Ethics. So why I'm also mentioning this is that, you know, we're open also for uh, more mentoring and also connecting people. That's also our role here at the Basel Institute. Um, and we'll be having a networking lunch, so that's also part of what we're trying to, to do today is really bring people together. Um, most of you have not met in the last four years since our last conference, so we encourage all of you to network during lunch. We'll be having an exhibition upstairs, um, so just leading on the stairs behind the coffee tables over there, you'll be able to meet uh, some of the Siemens Integrity Initiatives. Uh, so our integrity partners, but also some of uh, the uh, leading uh, collective actions out there, including FAFP. So if you're interested to learn more about that, it will be upstairs. So once again, please join me in uh, thanking the panel for uh, sharing their views today. Thank you.